uh, higher education is not about delivering a commodity, a BA, an MA, or a PhD, but about fostering a public good. Um, universities are meant to be producers not only of knowledge, but as uh, Drew Fow says, of doubt, of skepticism. Uh, universities should not give, in my words, comfort to the comfortable assumptions that people take for granted, the so-called common sense, but should rather afflict those comfortable common sense wisdoms that are so often wrong and so often dangerous to democratic society. So uh, universities are creative and unruly places. They should be spaces of dissent. They should allow for uh, di disparate voices, and we have to raise ourselves. Where are our chancellors? Where are our vice chancellors? I wanted to say a couple of things about two great chancellors that we have. OK. One of them was Clark Kerr, who was chancellor for a few years, and then he was president of <coughs> UCOP, of the you know, university. It was a plan that became a model for many great public universities in that it was very American. There was a space to guarantee everyone in the state of California higher education. The, meritor the meritocracy was at the very top. People from the public schools could get into one of the great UC systems. The next tier would get to the state level. And those who didn't manage for maybe complicated class reasons and other reasons be able to perform well on exams, they got into the community colleges and they could work their way. They could get, grab that, that uh, you know, that, uh, that same prize, if you want to call it, the, uh, the gold ring on the academic carousel, whatever it is. And we all know, those of us who teach, that some of our very best undergraduate students have come up from that community uh, system. And, uh, and Kerr, now, he struggled with campus unrest. And, uh, you know, because of that, he was dismissed from his position. He was fired. But he survived the nasty pol political attacks. He overcame the humility uh, or humiliation of his abrupt dismissal. And he left behind a robust, world-famous university. And uh, so Clark Kerr, was, Clark Kerr, like all of the great and visionary administrators that we've had in the past, was himself an educator, um, a researcher, a writer, an academic, who understood the difference between higher education as a commodity to be bought and sold, and higher education as a public good, as well as an engine behind this once great state's enormous productivity, ingenuity, creativity to the arts, the sciences, media communications, technology, uh, and bioscience, not to mention weapons research, which I'd rather not mention. Okay, decades later, one other chancellor, and I'm showing some pictures of what Berkeley looked like during the People's Park. People were killed, one person killed, one person blinded, uh, tear gas. Just to let you know that the possibility of the state entering in is always there. If you step a little bit too far, we won, peacemaking. Here's Chang Lin Tian who is the chancellor. He brought a human and a personable touch, as well as a global vision, that saw California as part of the Pacific Rim and as a global leader in making sure of the diversity on campus that it was representative of California's underrepresented minorities. He was the seventh chancellor, the first Asian American. He was himself an engineering professor. He was an expert in thermal science. He fought with all his might and all his heart and soul for affirmative action before and after UC regents voted against it in 1995. We have a chancellor today who says he's a diversity chancellor. I don't see it. I see inviting wealthy people to come in and take seats that were designed for people in this, in this state, an anti-affirmative action move. It's very, very frightening. So Tian was an educated to the core he was a fervent believer in free speech. Although his own family had escaped the communist revolution in China in 1949 to live in Taiwan, Chancellor Chen helped me personally override the State Department's hostility to Cuba by giving his personal support a letter and a telephone call to the State Department to allow Dr. Jorge Perez, director of the Cuban AIDS Sanatorium and two of his HIV positive patients, come to Berkeley. I told him, Chancellor Chen, you don't need to do this. He said, 
do you think we could invite Fidel Castro to, sp to speak as well? <laughs> you know, this is small potatoes here. Uh, he was very upset about a misguided UCOP plan to cut back on faculty salaries and to give a golden handshake offered to faculty that were not so senior. I mean, they were senior in esteem, senior in, in, in their reputations, senior in their research, but not in their age. And many of them took advantage of the incentives, and we've never really recovered from that program. Some of our most renowned and active and world-famous scholars left. A few of them taking the bait and then taking lucrative academic positions elsewhere in Ivy League schools where a good proportion of our people could leave at any time they wished. Tian was also, uh, he was, he was uh, trying to retaliate against this by actively recruiting young faculty, by trying to keep faculty here and not leaving without having to grant gigantic pay packages. He tried to play to our loyalty to the state, to the reason for being here as opposed to being at the University of Pennsylvania or Princeton or Harvard. Um, and he said at one point that he would do everything to keep Berkeley on the top. It's not a matter of whether we can survive, he said in 1993, when he asked the public to help spare the campuses dismantling by lobbying their legislators and by contributing to the university. He was outreach to the alumni. He said it's a matter of being excellent or mediocre, and that's where we are today. It's that, it's that question. Um, he raised uh, a total of $1.44 million. That was Chancellor Tian. He got it from alumni and friends of UC Berkeley. He got it from some of those friends in Asia. That money was directly plowed back into student diversity scholarships, research funds, and new professorships. There was one mortal blow that Tian didn't survive, in which I do believe. I knew him fairly well, contributed to his, his I know he had cancer and such, but why he just really didn't survive emotionally that blow. And that was when the UC system um, you know, uh, attracted national attention with the Regents' 10, 14 to 10 vote to drop affirmative action programs. Tian argued passionately against the governor, against the regents, for keeping Berkeley's affirmative action program in place. When he lost the fight, he grieved deeply and he grieved publicly. The immediate drop in the number of black, Latino, Native American students at Berkeley, its effect was felt immediately. He never lost his love of UC or his loyalty to faculty and students. He maintained an open door for faculty, most of whom he knew by first name. In 1996, he submitted his resignation as chancellor, saying that he'd done his best to accomplish the goals for an open, free, independent, and excellently diverse public institution, but he could no longer serve in that capacity. So we've, lost, we've had great chancellors. I know many people will be talking about other things that we want, but I want accountability from our chancellors, our vice chancellors, our deans, and uh, I have a number of other things that I could ask for, but I'd like to now just end this and say, we've had many recessions, we lived through the Great Depression, we lived through the Great Recession of the 90s, we can live through this one and we can grow, we don't have to be uh, demolishing this great institution.